he's going to be presenting a very interesting and um, uh, somehow controversial, controversial topic on duodenal switch with a question mark if it's on the rise. So Fadi, go ahead. Good morning, uh, Dr. Uh, Rogila and uh, the audience. Uh, I just want to start with a word of thanks uh, to Dr. Rogila and the organizing committee for inviting me and allowing me to touch this uh, quite, as you say, uh, interesting and controversial topic, I suspect, for an audience mostly in the U.S. Uh, we'll uh, address why in a few seconds. Uh, I was asked specifically to comment on whether Duodenal Switch was on the rise. Th that was the title. And uh, these are just a learning objectives for CME purposes. The presentation will take the following scope. I'll talk a little bit about the history of malabsorptive procedures. I'll uh, try to show a short video of the technique highlighting the, uh, the parts relevant to the uh, duodenal switch procedure. And then we'll talk about some of the clinical benefits of surgery of this particular uh, procedure and then highlight some of the important long-term surgical and nutritional complications. So the question, do we need to switch on the rise? Um, when posed with this, I thought, how best to answer this question? Uh, because in, an, in itself, it raises a number of questions. Uh, one way is uh, perhaps to uh, take a uh, cross-sectional uh, uh, survey of uh, practiced procedures across uh, the United States, Canada, or the world and to try to get a sense of the number of procedures performed without necessarily being an expert in DS or knowing what the DS is about to uh, explore some of the other reasons why it would be very useful to apply in uh, morbidly obese patients or not. Another, of course, is to try to look at the unique properties of the operation and, uh, and get a sense of whether this seems to be on the rise, even though uh, current data might not be sufficiently available or might only give us uh, uh, a limited understanding. And then once we answer it, we want to pose the question as to why. Why, is it, why are the trends as they are? So I thought I'd start by showing a very recent publication in the Journal of Obesity Surgery that actually addressed this question. Uh, it posed the uh, question to uh, about 50 uh, leading nations or nation groupings, uh, uh, memberships of IFSO. And they tried to uh, get a sense of the number of bariatric surgeries performed worldwide, the number of surgeons, the type of operations. And they've done a similar uh, a survey in 2008. And they basically not only were able to give us a cross-sectional picture of what's happening more recently in 2011, but to compare that all the way uh, from 2003 onwards. And as you can see from this graph, the uh, line depicting the biliopancreatic uh, divergent procedure with or without duodenal switch is in purple here and it's in the bottom of the of the graph so you can quickly tell that it is the least uh, commonly performed procedure worldwide so by looking at the surface uh, we uh, uh, it, we arrive at an intuitive answer i think most of us uh, practicing in this field uh, knew that much at least uh, uh, but I think if we scratch beyond that a little bit, we'll start to find some interesting trends and peculiarities that might give us a sense of where this procedure is, is going in the recent and uh, long future. And that starts with uh, noticing the little blip or the circle that I highlighted relating to the changes that happened between 2008 and 2011 regarding the uh, adjustable gastric band. And the, and the sleeve gastrectomy. As you see, the sleeve gastrectomy has taken prominence on the worldwide stage, and the number of bands performed have declined. The overall number of procedures, according to this survey, has been stable worldwide, estimated at around 340,000 procedures. So what are the countries that are performing the BPDDS? Uh, this is a list, basically. I don't expect you to, to look too closely at this, but I summarize it on the side here for you. I identifying South America, mostly Brazil, as doing the most of these procedures worldwide. And then we have U.S. and Canada, followed by Argentina. In Europe, the leading nations doing this are Italy, Spain, France, the Netherlands. There's some practice evolving in the Middle East and Asia. But what I also found particularly interesting, and it's in small number here, I put a circle around this country, Japan. And they seem to have 45 duodenal switch procedures out of a total of 170 total uh, cases per year, and the Roux-en-Y gastric bypass here has a number of about 23. 
The sleeve, on the other hand, has taken again a sharp rise, keeping along uh, consistent with trends, and you see 94. So this gives me just a little hint of what's happening in Asia and maybe what's about to happen across the world as more and more of the sleeve gastrectomy is being performed. Now, if we look at these regional trends in the Asia-Pacific region a little more closely, I wanted to show you uh, the numbers here beyond Japan, but in Asia as a whole, and you see that the number of BPDDSs rose to 118 from about 5 in 2008, re reflecting a significant percentage increase. But I think the, more, the absolute number is more important here, and, and this is a table comparing it to the rest of the procedures. So to answer our important question, let's keep in mind that globally uh, its utilization remains low, less than, temp less than 3%. On a regional basis, in the U.S. and Canada, rates have been actually stable, around 1%. In Europe, there's a decline in BPDS procedure, and this uh, is in favor of a rise in the Roux-en-Y gastric bypass and the sleeve gastrectomy. In South, and in South America, there's an absolute increase in the number of uh, duodenal switches and in the percent, as you saw, uh, similarly in, in the Asia-Pacific region. So the answer to the question is, is yes and no. No, rates have been stable. It's still the least performed procedure, but there is indicators that there is more and more interest in this procedure. I think the, to explore why together, we're going to talk about some of the benefits of the surgery and the, uh, and the nutritional and surgical implications in the long term. But th oh, that only after going through a little bit of the, uh, the history and how we arrived at the duodenal switch. I'll uh, pause a few minutes for any questions uh, if you have at this moment. Before I continue, uh, Fadi, th thanks for this nice introduction. Uh, uh, can you hear me okay? Okay, th that was, that yes, was, I can hear you clearly. Th that was a nice introduction. Uh, did you have any thoughts uh, why South America is, is picking up with uh, the switch? Do they have more heavily obese patients, for example, or more diabetics? Or is there any, any other reason that you can pick up from the literature? That, that's an excellent question, and I think I'll, I'll address that as I, co as I go through the rest of my presentation. But I think you've addressed uh, a couple of important factors. The indication of the procedure, and, uh, and another one I've hinted to is the fact that the sleeve gastrectomy, ha which is a component of the biliopancreatic diversion with the duodenal switch, is being offered more and more, and a lot of the patients come back for uh, further surgery for weight loss, and it's a natural procedure to be performed by a... Uh, a, a group of expert surgeons in the region who are comfortable offering this procedure as well. Okay. So, do we have I'll any other questions? Now, if I may, uh, Dr. Ogilo is. I'm sorry. Do you have any other questions from uh, from the participants? Any other thoughts about the statistics? No, no. no questions. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. So I'm going to take you through a quick tour of the history here in a couple of slides by uh, starting with the, uh, the earliest reported, if I may say, bariatric procedure, which was malabsorptive in nature. And this goes back to 1952. And I say reported, but unpublished, because it didn't have the original publication. But a surgeon in Sweden by the name of Victor Hendriksen first offered patients weight loss surgery by deciding to resect about a 105 centimeter segment of the small bowel. Now, I don't know what segment that was or what happened with that patient. But then there was another uh, uh, surgery performed in 1953 in Minnesota by Dr. Varko, who did the, uh, the well-known historic jejunoileal bypass. And that uh, constituted an end-to-end jejunoileal -end anast uh, anastomosis. And they had an ileocecal anastomosis as well with the proximal segment of the ileum connected to the cecum to allow drainage of this proximal small bowel, as you can see in the diagram here. The idea was to induce a maximum amount of weight loss and to try to reverse this in the, in the future when uh, weight loss was achieved, because as you can imagine, this sort of reconstruction is associated with significant physiological uh, and metabolic changes. In 1954, we started to see the first publications of, of uh, bariatric procedures, and they were basically evolutions of this procedure. Again, work in Minnesota by Dr. Kremen and his group. Uh, they did the jejunoileal bypass in dogs and then in human subjects. Uh, and uh, basically what they tried to do at the time uh, was similar to what I depicted in 1963. A group of surgeons in California, Dr. Payne and DeWind, well known for their work in the jejunoileal bypass, they did a, a, a jejunal colonic anastomosis, 
uh, initially like this, as described here, but then quickly, because of the symptoms, decided to do the jejunar ileal bypass, where they connected uh, the uh, proximal jejunum to a distal segment of ileum. And uh, the idea there was to basically avoid the, the anastomosis with the colon, give it a common channel, but they found that weight loss uh, failure was starting to be observed in this group of patients, and that was deemed related to the reflux of food back into the, uh, the, uh, the blind limb. This is not to, to mention the symptoms associated with the blind limb in terms of bloat, uh, gas bloat syndrome and discomfort, as well as all the other changes. So then with time, by 1969, people went back to the uh, end-to-end -end jejunal ileal anastomosis, where they connected the jejunum to the ileum directly without a common channel, and then they took this proximal part of the intestine and collected, connected it somewhere to the, to the colon, whether it's the cecum, the transverse colon, or the sigmoid, to allow for drainage of this blind loop. So that was the first generation of malabsorptive procedures. Second generation is, is uh, due to the work of a well-known uh, surgeon in, in Italy, Dr. Scopinaro, who basically championed the original biliopancreatic diversion procedure. And his procedure involved a horizontal gastrectomy and a connection of a 250-centimeter elementary limb of intestine with a 50-centimeter common channel. Did a lot of work in this, started with experiments and dogs and then humans, and over the years demonstrated some magnificent results in terms of weight loss and sustainability of the effect over time. Around the, the, the 80s to 90s, uh, there was similar work was done uh, uh, in terms of the malabsorptive surgery. Uh, and in 1988, Dr. Hess uh, and his son, Dr. Hess, in Ohio, uh, basically introduced the concept of the duodenal switch procedure. And, uh, and did their first case as a revisional procedure in a, in a subject, in a patient that failed to lose weight after a, a, a vertical gastroplasty. And uh, they came across a paper reported by De Meester uh, describing the duodenal switch and its use for uh, eliminate, eliminating duodenal gastric bile reflux and decided to apply it. And they uh, quickly found it to be their uh, procedure of choice and collected a series of over 1,400 patients, which they reported on uh, somewhere around 2005, 2007. Now, in the meantime, our work here, a group in, uh, in Quebec, uh, championed by Dr. Marceau and Biron, they were doing bariatric surgery back in the 80s, but they were doing the, the uh, standard Scopinaro procedure. In 1990, they decided to do the duodenal switch procedure, and the first case of the duodenal switch involved the connection of the duodenum to the distal ileum, but involved stapling of the, of the duodenum closed without resection, resecting it. This was done for a couple of years. Again, problems were experienced with weight loss failure and weight regain after initial failure, as you can imagine, due to breakdown of the stapling and some revisional surgery was required. They adopted in 1992 the uh, BPDDS, accumulated a large series, and they were the first to report and describe the standard uh, value pancreatic duodenal switch procedure. Any comments at this point? Uh, so, Fadi, to, to summarize, uh, looks like most of those uh, uh, procedures were done initially as a second stage after failing uh, another procedure. That was the history of, uh, uh, of duodenal switch. Is that correct? It was the, uh, the history of the duodenal switch is such that it was first applied in a patient that failed weight loss. Very quickly, within two to three month, months in Ohio, Dr. Hess applied it as a primary procedure, as a full duodenal switch. Now, the limb length were different than what is described as the standard DS today. They had a common channel of 75 centimeters, for example, as opposed to the 100 that we use now. But the concept of switching the duodenum and having a common enterosteostomy as a primary procedure was first offered in 1988 in Ohio. Okay, do we have any other questions from the audience? Okay, I think we should continue. Okay. So I'll go quickly through the Quebec duodenal switch procedure and just uh, to facilitate further discussion. What it involves is a gastrectomy, taking away more than 65% of the stomach. We divide the duodenum about two to four centimeters uh, from the pylorus. 
we do a connection to the elementary limb, leaving an elementary track of 250 centimeters of ilium. And, and then the biliopancreatic limb, which you see on this side here, is connected at 100 centimeters from the ileocecal valve. I want to show you a quick video. If I have a few minutes, I'll try to skip through some of it. So I'm just going to show the interesting part for the audience. The sleeve gastrectomy, enteroenteric anastomosis, and all that, uh, I'll leave for the webcast, maybe later if there is interest. But OK, this is starting right at the okay, duodenal switch, the duodenal dissection. So this is a, a patient. She's a 44-year-old female with a BMI of 52. And basically, I'm skipping right to the part where I'm outlining the anatomy. That's the pancreas there. That's the inferior edge of the first part of the duodenum and the pylorus and the prepyloric and postpyloric veins of mayo you see there. I'm starting to divide the visceral peritoneum and work my way across this duodenum to divide it and then uh, uh, get it ready for the anastomosis. As you can see, I used the hook electric cautery to, to control these fine delicate vessels. I do the same on the superior edge of the uh, duodenum. And then I try to develop just a little window using a right angled instrument to allow me to pass an intestinal grasper underneath through the nice plane that begins just before the head of the pancreas, just distal to the duodenum, and usually a little bit of traction and pushing and gently holding the duodenum between the grasper. I'm able to create that plane. I pass usually a, a latex penrose drain. This patient was uh, allergic to latex, so I used an umbilical tape. Create that window dot ready for passage of a blue loaded uh, stapler. Okay, can I ask you something? Uh... Yes, go ahead. Uh, so, no, this is patient with body mass index of 52. Um, so is, is uh, DS your primary choice in patients uh, above BMI of 50? Uh, yes, in fact, uh, it is. And it is our, not only uh, in uh, supermorbidly obese patients, but it's our primary procedure here overall. I'll be talking about some trends uh, a little uh, later in the presentation, but we have started to do more and more sleeve gastrectomies recently in contrast to our historical practice here. Uh, and uh, this uh, is in keeping with our overall objective of offering patients to adenal switch surgery, but uh, perhaps staging them. Uh, and it has something to do with the advent uh, of laparoscopy, which I'll be addressing as well. Maybe while you're showing this, uh, Fadi, I want to ask uh, Dr. Dan Heron from Mount Sinai. Uh, I remember from my days when I was a fellow, there, uh, you were doing a lot of uh, uh, DSs. Uh, are you still doing them uh, at Mount Sinai in New York, uh, Dan? Uh, we are still doing them. In fact, I think uh, Dr. Keeney sitting to my right has one on the schedule for Monday. Uh, but we become very selective about the patients that we're doing them in. Uh, I think it was Dr. Scopinaro who described his operation, the, the BPD, as a powerful car. And then after describing it as such, he would show a picture of a sports car which had driven into a tree and crashed. And that's what we're trying to avoid is the long-term nutritional complications that you can end up with when you have a highly malabsorptive operation where you're malabsorbing not only protein uh, but iron and calcium and, and a number of other micronutrients. So. Uh, you have to be very selective in who you're doing this operation on, and you have to make sure that they're not going to get lost to follow-up and that they're going to be able to comply with a post-operative regimen that is far more complex than what you'd see for a sleeve or for a gastric bypass. By selection, you mean body mass index uh, and patient's compliance or anything else? If, if a patient, I am very reluctant to do this operation on any patient who doesn't come into my office and ask for it by name and pronounce it correctly. Uh, if they say, yeah, I heard about this other fancy pants operation that has some malabsorption, if, if they haven't done the, you know, 
12 hours of internet research and come in with a stack of papers this high explaining it to me in detail, they're not going to, my feeling is that they're not going to have the, the wherewithal to manage all the issues that come up postoperatively in terms of the nutritional issues. Um, I, don't, I don't describe this as a powerful car. I say it's like a Mack truck. It's the Mack truck of bariatric operations. It's extremely powerful. It has tremendous capabilities, but it's going to require a little bit more management than the Toyota, you know, parked in your garage. Okay, thank you. So let's I go. Think an additional. I... Yes, please, please continue. Uh, you know. Uh, yeah, I think an additional indication is a very severe diabetes, where. Uh, of sort of in quotes curing diabetes. So in such cases of, di of severe diabetes, um, do you offer this as the primary choice? Or? Sometimes we do. If, if it's really severe diabetes and it looks as if none of the other operations are likely to, in quotes again, cure it, then we do sometimes offer this as a primary choice. But like Dan said, it's a very highly selective uh, uh, group of patients that we uh, do this operation. And do you have any threshold of diabetes uh, uh, parameters, like certain mm -hmm. uh, hemoglobin A1C or uh, medications or First, insulin? And despite that, their uh, uh, HbA1C levels are very high. We don't have a, like a threshold, but poor control despite maximum medical therapy, uh, and they've had diabetes for a long time, it's unlikely that either a restricted operation or even a gastric bypass is likely to uh, reverse their diabetes. That's when we think of it. But th that's a very small group of patients that we see in a year. But we do think of that uh, as an indication. OK, let's continue uh, with Dr. Mustara. OK, I'm glad we started to address some of the, uh, the metabolic issues because I'll be highlighting, highlighting that very quickly. I just skipped through one or two slides about some of the statistics reflecting our experience here in Quebec and stopping and pausing at the slide from 2012 to give you a sense of the current trends. So while historically the procedure was performed as the main number one procedure and it was performed mostly open, you can see in 2012 the open BPDDS is offered constitute about 16% of our total surgery. Most of what we offer is laparoscopic over 80% of the procedures, but the sleeve fraction consistent with global trends seems to be prominent about 52%. While we do, well, we've done in 2012 about 31% lap BPDDSs. Now again, the idea is a lot of these patients are not to have this end up with it as primarily unless the patient chooses and there is a good reason to keep them just with the sleeve uh, uh, especially for those mentioned by Dr. Heron earlier. If they're happy and they don't want to uh, pursue, uh, push forward, uh, then uh, of course uh, uh, their wishes are respected as long as uh, uh, there are no problems. So I'm going to go right now and talk about some of the clinical outcomes. I don't want to stress this too much because we're all familiar with where the BPDS, the MAC track as he called it, uh, ranks in terms of its power and potency for weight loss as well as resolution of comorbidities. This is a paper from 2004 by uh, Dr. B um, uh, Henry Buckwald showing a 70% excess weight loss. Again, in comparison to the others, you can see where it is. This is our experience here over the years and what we have is, is a, a graph of a 15-year follow-up with the weights in actual kilograms indicated and the change in cumulative, you know, mean weights over time. And we not only do we see a good, you know, 50 to 60 kilogram weight loss, but the important thing to highlight, as Dr. Scopinero did in his early series as well, is how this is so beautifully maintained over time. And this is where a lot of the other procedures seem to fall short. And it has a lot to do with the physiology of the operation. Now, if we were to compare this with uh, a well-known publication, the SOS study, and see where the weight change, uh, how the weight change graph looks in comparison to the, the bands, the vertical gastropath, the gastric bypass, the gastric bypass, you'll see here that the DS results in about 34% uh, reduction in total body weight loss and again maintained over time. Outcomes. Uh, this is from the 2004 paper, again highlighting the, how uh, good it is in terms of its effect on di type 2 diabetes resolution, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, and sleep apnea. 
So these are the benefits. This is just a, a quick snapshot of our database on last follow-up, seeing how uh, the responses that we have, again, highlighting its power mostly in lipid metabolism, metabolism and in diabetes resolution, as well as sleep apnea. So uh, this one, though, captures the point well. This is from the New England Journal of Medicine, published uh, just last year, the group from Ingroni doing a randomized trial comparing BPD gastric bypass and medical therapy, following patients over a period of two years and having about 20 patients in each arm. And on the uh, uh, left-hand side, you see that the, the glycated hemoglobin reflected in percentage points, and uh, you can tell very quickly that uh, there is a marked reduction in hemoglobin A1C in diabetic patients, and uh, it, is, uh, it surpasses all the other options in the, the other arms in the trial, and is also maintained to up to a two-year period. And this was uh, uh, based on biochemical markers of diabetes resolution, hemoglobin A1C, and other data included fasting blood glucose. From our group, we had a similar cohort of patients from 2006 onwards that were followed over time. We took a look at their hemoglobin A1C level depicted here on the left-hand side. And if we look just at the lines on the top, you see three colors, red being the group of diabetic, insulin-dependent diabetics. The others are patients on oral hypoglycemic agents only, and others are diabetics that are managed by diet control. And where pre-op values seem to vary depending on the, where the patient sits in their spectrum of disease, in all patients, DS was powerful in reducing the hemoglobin A1C over time and up to 60 months post-op and keeping it under the, the level uh, defining uh, uh, type 2 diabetes. The color bars here, if you want to just take a look at that for a second, reflect the number of patients in each group, green being diet controlled, orange oral hypoglycemic dependent, and then the other insulin dependent. These are the numbers on the right-hand scale over here. And what's marked is, is the, how the oranges and reds kind of disappeared with time. The greens also shrunk as well, uh, but the, this demonstrates the power of this procedure in addressing diabetes. Uh, this is, again, a summary of how much remission we observed uh, in, in a series of uh, uh, 800, uh, 900 diabetic patients followed for a mean follow-up time of seven years, and we saw uh, quite a marked 89% uh, uh, remission and 8% improvement over that timeline. This is a slide depict depicting some of the improvements in lipids and the stability of that over time as well. So if you want, I can open to questions for a few minutes or continue to quickly explore the complications, nutritional and surgical, with you. A very quick question. Uh, so you presented uh, seven years uh, uh, data. Um, do you see any, any uh, you know, significant numbers of patients with reoccurrence of diabetes after uh, DS? As you know, you know, after bypass, there is a certain group of patients especially those who regain weight, they tend to have a reoccurrence of diabetes. So how is it with DS? That's a very good question. Actually, we're in the process of surveying our database to answer that question in particular, the, the, uh, the rate of remission. And we're doing that by looking at what data we captured, as well as uh, sending out some patient surveys. I don't have a specific number answer, but I can tell you that it is, is remarkably low in, in the uh, Two years that I've been here and seeing patients, I haven't come across that as a remission after in, in, in uh, my uh, uh, clinic patients. And overall, it is not something that, uh, that comes as a blip on our radar. Now, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Uh, we do manage a large number of the 4,000 to 5,000 patients that have been operated on as outpatients, and we do have the help of their family physicians. But it's an important question, and we are in the process of exploring it to see how it compares to uh, Ruin Y. So with regards to complications, just some ge general points about the uh, uh, fact that obesity in itself uh, makes uh, the, the, uh, uh, poses some s surgical challenges and is associated with perioperative complications, whether that be related to the anesthesia in, a, in an obese, morbidly obese patient with uh, cardiopulmonary comorbidities or due to the exposure limitations that are encountered, especially, especially in the context of laparoscopy. Laparoscopy has been applied to the procedure since the early 1990s from the work of Dr. Gagné and his group, but uh, uh, 
one must keep in mind that uh, even though it has been associated with lower complications overall in surgery and in bariatric surgery, as well as faster recovery, issues pertaining to access, exposure, handling of bowel, advanced skill, and time for the procedure are issues to consider when compared to other procedures such as the adjustable gastric band, the Brunoy gastric bypass, and the, particularly the now uh, emerging sleeve gastrectomy. The importance uh, that becomes more and more apparent with increasing uh, obesity and as the BMI starts to climb up uh, beyond 52, 53, 55, etc. cetera. Uh, this is just a quick summary of some of the complications. The message from this slide is to take some early postoperative complications as well as some late. I'll highlight them in a list with some numbers for you in the following slide. Uh, this is from the published literature. Commonly reported leak rates are around 1%, but it can be up to 20% in some small series. Venous thromboembolism uh, has been reported uh, at around 2.2%, and this is taking into account DVTs as well as PE. And this is a good number from a solid study done from the Michigan Cooperative, where they looked at their numbers and, and basically came up with the incidence of PE uh, uh, to, to help us uh, uh, get a better sense of the numbers. Hemorrhage does occur, and it uh, occurs at a low rate, and it often doesn't require transfusions. Marginal ulcers were, are particular to PBDDS, uh, as they are to Renoir gastric bypass. Uh, sorry, are particular to biliopancreatic diversion, but not the DS type. They were more seen with the Scopinaro procedure. Our group experienced it here when they were doing the Scopinaro procedure, and the actual switch allowed a marked reduction in the uh, rate of mar marginal ulceration. Stenosis uh, can occur and happens at a rate anywhere from 0 to 11 percent. Dumping uh, is less of a problem with the duodenal switch procedure, but may be seen with the biliopancreatic without switch. Uh, and uh, intestinal obstruction occurs at the known rate of 3%. Cholelithiasis postoperatively, if the gallbladder is not removed, can be expected with an incidence of 12%, and about 8 to 10% end up needing to have their gallbladder removed. Changes in bowel habits are removed and are important symptoms to follow in these patients, and they uh, usually don't exceed, on average, more than three bowel movements a, a day and are experienced by a third of the patient. Uh, weight recid recidivism or weight loss failure is, is not a common problem at all in this surgical population. In fact, as uh, some of uh, the uh, audience members have mentioned, uh, concern regarding uh, excessive weight loss may be an issue, but I'll highlight, highlight that as well because it's not as common as people think. Uh, this is just a quick paper that uh, we reviewed here together, looking at a thousand cases and uh, trying to address the issue of the short-term outcomes, and particularly perioperative mortality. In a thousand patients that we reviewed uh, from 2006 onwards, we had about 220 laparoscopic procedures and 770 open ones. The mean BMI was about 51. And the thing I want to mention for you here is indicated in this slide is that after 2006. After November 2006, when we were doing this procedure more laparoscopically, our mortality rate fell uh, to about 0.07 percent. But overall, in the thousand uh, patients, mortality rate was 1 percent. This is a quick uh, description of some of the expected perioperative complication, and um, I don't want to highlight the differences between laparoscopy and laparotomy here, but I, ju I do want to mention that leaks uh, do occur and, uh, and their rate uh, is variable and there need to be strategies in place to deal with them. Okay, some of the nutritional problems. Over the long term, anemia, hypocalcemia, hypoalbuminemia, and I, I, I make a distinction between that and protein calorie malnutrition, where the former is common, the latter is actually quite rare. And having to take somebody back to surgery for protein calorie malnutrition is, is indeed a rare occurrence. And we've experienced it here at our center in about uh, less than 1.5% of our patients overall. This is a graph showing what happens to protein albumin if followed over time. And basically, it shows that the majority of our patients may have a, de a deficiency, but not an insufficiency. Most of the albumin levels, if this is a percentage of the patients that have albumins either below 32, below 34, or 36, majority are actually well above 32, and only about 2.5% ever get to that concerning point. And even those can be managed with hospital admissions, nutritional support, sometimes even as outpatients with diet adjustment, because compliance with the postoperative diet is very much related to the evolution of the uh, protein um, uh, energy balance. 
some serum biochemistry reflecting some of the uh, changes that happen over time. This is from the publication of Dr. Marceau in 2007, where he basically reviewed his, his 15 year experience with an average 10 year follow up and reported some of the biochemical changes that are seen. As you can see, protein albumin, although there is a um, a small amount of insufficiency after surgery, the actual deficiency is only in 0.9% of the patients. Similarly, most patients' anemia is stable, calcium metabolism is stable, but again, this happens with supplementation. I'll describe the regimen in, in about a minute. And uh, vitamin A, uh, also there's a, there's a decrease in vitamin A. We have about insufficiency noted in about 21%, but a real, but a real deficiency in under 2%, and rarely was that associated with any clinical signs of nighttime vision blindness, et cetera. It was picked up because of the follow-up that we do and uh, allows us the opportunity to intervene. So what changes, increases happen after surgery? There's an increase in folic acid if we compare patients before surgery and after surgery. There's an increase in their vitamin B12 level. Their iron levels, uh, sorry, the vitamin B12 levels are about stable. The iron uh, uh, is stable and the vitamin D uh, doesn't change very much because we tend to have an insufficiency in our preoperative patients and uh, this baseline level continues. Uh, we adjusted, but as uh, you saw from the calcium levels, we're able to maintain a good calcium level and follow their parathyroid hormone as well to make sure that we don't have implications for bone metabolism. And this is a, a, a quick snapshot of the parathyroid hormone and the alkaline phosphate. Both of these uh, levels are increased. They suggest that something is happening at the level of bone metabolism, but that uh, uh, has not been a clinically apparent in terms of increased fracture rates or uh, clinically significant rates of osteoporosis. Dr. Marceau also did a review uh, published a few years ago and looked at the 10-year uh, bone disease outcomes and found really no significant uh, uh, clinical changes in terms of uh, the uh, indicators I mentioned. This is another publication uh, that we put through in 2010. Uh, studying the effect of this operation in patients with a BMI of less than 50. It's, again, similar to what I showed you in the other two slides and highlights the important points, especially about albumin, that real deficiency was also seen in 1.1% of these patients, even though they started at a lower BMI. So people don't wither away with a DS, even if they start with a BMI of less than 50. They tend to find a natural physiologic weight and, and maintain that weight. This is our post-operative care regimen. Uh, what we do we give patients post is one multivitamin daily, calcium gluconate 500 milligrams a day, ferrous sulfate 300 milligrams a day, vitamin D 50,000 units and A 20,000 units, and we prescribe this for life. And over time, what we find is the calcium goes up and the need for vitamin D may go up as well. Uh, H2 blockers are prescribed, uh, or PPIs, more PPIs today, for the first two, uh, two to three months and are stopped unless there's a good indication afterwards. We tend to stop antihypertensives and hypoglycemics postoperatively. And in terms of contraception, we uh, insist on double protection for the first 18-month period because of altered absorption of the contraceptive agents. This is the, the workup that we offer patients at a 3, 6, 9, and 12-month uh, interval and then annual thereafter and as needed, of course, depending on discovered abnormalities. So in conclusion, I just want to say that uh, BPDDS uh, remains uh, the least offered bariatric procedure globally, but it is a safe, it's one of the safe and most effective in achieving significant weight loss and control of comorbidities over a long-term follow-up compared to other available bariatric procedures. Its side effect profile does mandate long, lifelong follow-up, and postoperative vitamin and mineral therapy is essential uh, to avoid some of these clinically significant uh, nutritional complications. Protein calorie malnutrition and albumin deficiency is low in incidence, uh, and uh, revisional surgery to correct this problem is infrequent. Thank you, and I'll open up to questions. Thank, thank you very much. That was very good and very complete uh, presentation covering all aspects of uh, uh, DS. Okay, the you know, question to you, uh, very practical. Uh, in, in one of your first slides showed uh, increasing number of uh, um, sleeve gastrectomies, and uh, the, there is some data uh, showing um, uh, the long-term outcomes from from uh, sleeve uh, uh, slightly uh, less <clears throat> uh, if successful than than other procedures. So presumably. 
those patients with uh, you no know, kind of failed or semi-failed uh, uh, sleeve gastrectomies, they will come back to us in a few years with a question what to do next. Uh, so in such cases, I, I think you will probably offer them DS. Is it right? But uh, would you make um, any comments on who should be getting uh, DS and who should be getting gastric bypass as a second stage after failed or not very successful sleeve? We traditionally here, as you know, in Cleveland Clinic, been doing uh, gastric bypasses as a second stage. Uh, but I wonder what, what your comments are on uh, DS as a real second stage. Should we do this or should we do gastric bypass? Uh, thank you for that question. That's actually a very interesting question to address in this forum. Before I move back to that slide, I don't think if I, I don't think I have to, but I just want to point out a picture of all my wonderful colleagues who I work very closely and uh, have learned from and worked with in applying the duodenal switch procedure. As you know, I did a lot of my work uh, on ruin Y gastric bypass as a fellow. And so to, as a lead up to answer your question, uh, in the context of somebody who's had failed weight loss or weight recidivism, uh, who also had a sleeve gastrectomy. The beauty of a sleeve gastrectomy is it is amenable to one, revision, making you can re-sleeve it. Two, you can offer a ruin y gastric bypass. Three, you can offer further restriction by applying an, a, a ring, uh, a sylastic band, or an adjustable uh, <coughs> gastric band. And four, you can offer a BPDDS. So how do you decide? I think a lot of factors have to be taken into consideration. Number one, the fact that there is an indication for further weight loss and failed restrict restriction to achieve the goal. So after performing a, a, a well thought out investigation and reevaluation of the psychosocial and nutritional factors for the patient and eliminating any factors that have contributed to this weight loss, you want to think about, okay, it is indicated now to offer a second procedure, but what is going to give you the most weight loss and maintained over time? Because most of the, the comorbidities have either improved or went into remission when they come back for their second procedure. Some of them will have the reemergence of their diabetes depending on their weight and control, but it becomes the sustainability of this weight over time. And, and I pose uh, the, the idea that if you want to achieve that and not come back a second and third time, you want to give them a physiologic procedure that functions by maintaining that stability in weight loss physiologically by imposing a threshold to amount of not protein and not sugar, but complex carbohydrate and lipid, lipid absorption by dictating and defining the length of alimentary tract available for, 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 for the future lifespan of this patient, you're basically setting the thermostat. And by doing that kind of operation, you also avoid operating in an area that has previously been operated on, which is the area of the sleeve. You can imagine the liver is going to be nicely adherent and covering up that area. So it takes up, takes away having to dissect in that zone. You go to a fresh area of surgery. You give them a good, powerful operation because they need it. On the other hand, if they don't really need a second procedure, I wouldn't offer any revisional surgery for a failed sleeve until we find out why. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, do we have Cleveland Clinic Weston? Oh, we have a pretty large audience. Uh, thank you, my friends from, from Weston uh, for joining us. I know you do a lot of sleeve gastrectomies. Uh, and what, what is your uh, second step, second stage? Do you do DS or bypass after failed? And do you have any fails, failed uh, sleeves at all? Dr. Somstein, I think, morning, and uh, Rosen. Raul, Dr. Right? Rosenthal and Chomsing are not, are not here right now. We're just uh, the fellows and the residents in the room, so we probably uh, wouldn't be appropriate for us to comment. Okay, so uh, no, from, from your experience at Weston, uh, how many patients with a, with a failed sleeve do you see in your, in your fellowship? You see them in the clinic. They're doing well uh, or? We, we do see uh, uh, a, a good number of patients that uh, we actually do revisions on. But as I said, uh, I think that Dr. Rosenthal will be the most appropriate person to comment on this. 
Okay, looks like you don't want right to don't want to get in trouble with Dr. Rosenthal. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Any other questions or comments from the audience? No, if not, I want to thank you, uh, Dr. Mustach. That was excellent presentation. Thank you for giving us uh, a, a fresh uh, information about DS, a, a procedure which is uh, uh, in a vision of many surgeons still controversial, and surgeons, including myself, are a little bit afraid of doing this. Uh, uh, but uh, I think um, you, know, you show us pretty encouraging results, especially uh, good results in terms of complications. They're not that terrible as uh, one might think. Um, uh, so again, thank you very much for, for sharing with us your, your, your great experience. We, uh, I want to invite everybody for next uh, series of uh, innovations, May 3rd. Uh, there will be top 10 innovations in surgery presented by Dr. Lee Stromson uh, at o Oregon Clinic and moderated by Dr. Adrian Park from any Arundel Medical Center. Again, thank you very much. Uh, have a great day. Uh, enjoy your operations today and whatever you have rest of the day. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much, Dr. Rogula, and the rest of the team for the invitation. Okay, thank it's you very pleasure. much.